Welcome to the You Lead Podcast, brought to you by the Council for School Leadership of the Alberta Teachers Association. All right, our guest today is Eileen Pollock, who was one of the first two women to graduate from Yale University with a Bachelor of Science in Physics. She later earned a Master of Fine Arts from the Iowa Writers' Workshop. She is the author of five novels, as well as two collections of short fiction. One of her novels, Breaking and Entering, was named in New York Times Editor's Choice Selection. Eileen's work of creative nonfiction, Women Walking Ahead in Search of Catherine Weldon and Sitting Bull, was recently made into a movie starring Jessica Chastain and Michael Gray Eyes. In her investigative memoir, The Only Women in the Room, Why Science is Still a Boys Club, was published by Beacon Press in 2015. A long excerpt appeared in the New York Times Sunday Magazine and went viral, after which she spent five years working to advance the opportunities for women and people of color in STEM fields. Her work has been selected for Best American Short Stories, Best American Essays, and Best American Travel Writing, Eileen's latest book, an essay collection titled Maybe It's Me on Being the Wrong Kind of Woman, was published in January of 2022 by Delphinium Books and received star reviews in both Publishers Weekly and Kirkus Reviews. A former director of the MFA program at the University of Michigan, she's now a professor emerita and lives and writes in Boston. Eileen, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. That is quite the introduction, and we are so looking forward to having you join us at ULEAD to talk about something that is incredibly important and something that we feel educators really have a role in helping, and that's equity uh, around especially women in the STEM fields. And, you know, I gave a little bit of that um, in, in the introduction. We talked a little bit about your background, but you know, you've talked a, a lot about and written about the problems of uh, low numbers of women in science and math and STEM. Can you tell us a little bit, introduce us to your experiences with this issue? Sure, thanks. Um, well, this goes back quite a way to when I was in junior high school. I grew up in a small town in upstate New York, and I was told that I couldn't take the few courses our school offered in, uh, in more advanced science and math because I was a girl and uh, I would only be wasting a seat in those classes because girls didn't go on in science and math, um, which of course is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I, I got angry. I started teaching myself science and math. Um, I taught myself calculus. I somehow got myself into Yale University, which had only recently gone co-ed. And there I found myself woefully behind my, uh, the some odd 116 odd male classmates in my intro to physics class, um, nearly all of whom had had two years of college-based calculus and physics. Um, I failed my first exam, which was a new experience for me. I had never failed anything and um, was going to drop the major, but um, I had a professor who wouldn't sign my withdrawal slip. And uh, as often happens, uh, people who are behind work 10 times harder. And um, I ended up at the top of my class um, doing all sorts of original research in theoretical physics. Um, And uh, I I graduated, uh, not to brag, summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa with honors in the major and then walked away from physics forever. Uh, And uh, a year or two later was washing dishes in a delicatessen outside Chicago. Um, I made myself over as a writer. And uh, many years later in 2005, when uh, Lawrence Summers, who was then president of Harvard, was wondering aloud why there weren't more women on his faculty in physics and math and the other sciences, um, he got into a lot of trouble by positing that maybe it was because women weren't as, uh, didn't have as high a science IQ at the very high end of the spectrum or didn't want to work as hard. Um, And I I actually knew Lawrence Summers, so I sat down to write him an email 
to explain that, no, that wasn't the reason there weren't more women. Um, I, I ended up with a 30-page email at 3 in the morning, but I realized I couldn't send it to him because, um, for one thing, you just don't do that to the president of a major university. But also, I realized I didn't really understand why I hadn't gone on. So I, um, I decided to write a book to try to find out. And I spent the next uh, five years researching, trying to figure out my own story um, and seeing whether it spoke to other women's experiences and to try to compare what I had gone through in the 70s to what women were still seemed to be experiencing in the two, 2000s. Um, I, it was hard to get the book published, but when it came out, uh, it, it well, an excerpt from it went viral in the New York Times. And um, I then spent, I, I would say the next five years of my life, but actually it's been the past 10, um, going around uh, talking at various institutions about women and minorities in STEM. So also my, my interest broadened to not only women, but people of color and um, underrepresented minorities. Now, it sounds like you spent a lot of time in this. I, I'm interested to know perhaps some of the, the main reasons why you have why you think that these either negative experiences or this lack of inclusion with women or minorities in the stem persists we know about this it feels like you know once you know about it we should be able to solve it um why do you think that this is an ongoing problem yeah that's a great question and there is still some of the bad old attitudes so there you know i was shocked to find that in the sciences unlike the humanities where i am now that there's something called the weed out course. So most freshman uh, college courses in the sciences traditionally have been seen by the professors as a, um, that their, their goal was to get rid of people, <laughs> which, which seems shocking. So if you, if you didn't come in very well prepared, um, you should go if you, um, for some reason, didn't look like someone who should be a physicist or a mathematician um, not only was there no effort to keep you, but, you know, so, so early preparation and those attitudes are, um, you know, still lack of early preparation and, and attitudes like that at the college level are still, you know, keeping people out. But much more than that today, it's just these attitudes we all grow up with. So women, as well as men, uh, people of color, we, we all grow up in a society um, I'm speaking in the United States, I'm sure it's um, true in Canada as well, in which um, we have these what are now called implicit biases. And we think we know what scientists look like. We think we know what talent looks like in STEM fields. And we're really just all operating on that standard notion of somebody who looks like Albert Einstein, white, male, with you know hair coming in. This, I mean, if you, if you ask elementary school students to draw a scientist, that's still who they draw even at a very young age. Um, so there are all sorts of um, you know, factors that come out of that, ways in which certain people are encouraged, certain people are not encouraged or, act or discouraged, um, not given the confidence um, actively. So here's an example. There's a very um, uh, liberal, well-resourced school system right uh, about a mile from where I live here in Boston. And there are very few black students in the black or female students in the advanced science and math courses. And one young black woman wrote into the newspaper who was reporting these statistics and said, well, I was a straight A student. I was in all the advanced courses in elementary school and junior high. And then when it came time for the teachers to select young people to go into the advanced high school classes, my teacher took me aside and said, oh, you know, you could take the advanced courses, but you'll get B's and C's. And she had, the teacher had no reason to say that, right? Um, she just assumed this person, you know, would, wouldn't do well. Um, the images in our, uh, we see on TV and magazines, every day, films, all, everything around us, the images themselves are a huge factor in um, who gets encouraged, who doesn't, whom we see as a scientist or a mathematician or a computer tech person. Um, so I, you know, I'm going to talk much more about this when I when I get there. But um, there's a lot that can be done uh, in ele elementary school and uh, middle school and high school 
to counter that sort of those sort of biases, that sort of discouragement, to encourage, to instill confidence. Um, we can talk more about that. Well, I'm looking forward to absolutely seeing it, you lead. So, uh, my last question is, you know, for people who are thinking about coming to you lead and who are going to see you present, what are what are some of what are you hoping they walk away from your session at you lead when it comes to moving towards equity, whether that be with minorities, whether that be with women? Um, what are you kind of hoping that they what's the big message that you hope they walk away with? Well, first of all, I hope no one feels attacked or singled out. As I said, this is something that just permeates our, our cultures that all of us are raised with. And there have been studies that, that show that, you know, women, people of color of every age, um, different regions of the continent have the same, it's, it's almost identical biases when it, when it comes to um, these problems. But to, to become more aware of those biases, to become more aware of the ways in which the subtle ways in which women and people of color are being discouraged or, and certainly not encouraged, um, and, and to feel more confident about how easy it is, how just one person, one comment from one person can change the course of a young person's life. If, if I had heard uh, you know, a sentence or two here or there, if I had had a mentor, if I had been aware of these factors when I was young, I'd be sitting here as a physicist, I'm quite sure. Not that I'm sorry I'm a writer, but um, that, that's the kind of difference just one, one comment either way can make. Thank you so much for your time today. I am so looking forward to seeing you in Banff in April and uh, looking forward to the messages that you can give us at ULEAD and for all of the educators that will be joining us. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And I'm looking forward to coming not only to meet you all, but I hear that Banff is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. So can't <laughs> it wait. absolutely is. Okay. We'll see you soon. Thanks.